Alright, time for another draft physics video presentation. Uh, today, fields, uh, forces, um, description versus explanation, pff, bullshit, <laughs> just these, just synonyms and such. Um, and uh, so this is, part of this is like a, the Ken Wheeler, um, I don't know, uh, pollution of the universe is these other people hook on to this jargon and rhetoric and um you know it's empty and meaningless and mushy so i will explain what a field is first off it's just an area right that's all it is is an area and if you have something in the area spots little x's there i now have a field of x's Obviously, the more X's, the more field-looking it is, but I just need one in there to say I have a field of X's. That's all it is. That's all a field is, is something you're identifying um, as uh, stuff in a region, period. You have a field, a field of corn, a field of wheat, a field of momentum. <laughs> yeah. So in physics, the idea is, is you're just recognizing that the area, whatever size we go with, the whole universe or solar system or some other place, and we can just say in that area, the idea would be is that there is some kind of effect happening because of stuff over here and stuff over here and stuff in different places. And each one of these things is doing something, okay? Something's happening relevant to them um they're changing what would be in here so because these things are there they're affecting this area okay with their magic powers basically their explanation their esp is <coughs> a field of esp essentially well anyway it's changing it so this if there was no of these things, this little bit of space would have a momentum in it, and this little bit would have a momentum going that way, and this little bit would have a momentum going that way, and this all adds up to some sort of thing. Like, if you are here, you will get hit with this piece of momentum, and you will end up moving over here. <clears throat> so, that's the, f the field. The field is what, um, in physics, is just cutting this into... A section and just saying what if I was right here what would happen to me well because these things are here there's going to be certain things that will hit me uh, their change in the field in this location will mean that I will have a net movement in that direction or whatever and that's um, does the the incomplete uh, description or explanation. So let's un first understand vocabulary. Descriptions can be complete explanations. I and mean, I can describe an elephant to you in such detail that I even give you its genetic history. I give it every kind of detail about this elephant. I have explained the elephant. Just by describing it, I explain it if, I, if my description is complete enough. So there is no distinction between these words. Uh, a detailed description is an explanation, uh, no doubt about it. And explanations can be just likewise. Um, you can explain an elephant by saying they're heavy. Well, that's not much. Of, that's not saying much, right? It's not explaining much. Um, it's not much of a description. And it, there's synonyms. There's just no point in playing a game like one thing is superior than the other thing. Um, is there not? So this isn't about vocabulary. Uh, it's about explaining why things happen. And so this subject will get into just this notion of what a magnet is, what dipoles are versus what a monopole is, and um, the basic function of charges. And so they keep doing this thing where they put two charges in and they change the nature of the organism because they have two things interacting with each other. They start talking about, well, what is this thing doing and what is this thing doing and then they'll show you what the net product is okay they won't explain to you how you got the net product they won't show you that they'll show you what's the net product what's the field here because of this well and this 
well, because of this and this, there's two different things happening. One thing is saying I'm attracted. One thing is saying I'm repelled. Okay. And so you can say, okay, I know what the net of this area of space is, if it has a charge there. Um, and the net's going to be some kind of, you know, curved motion into the object. Um, if I go through the space of being pushed by one thing, wind blowing this way, and wind essentially blowing this way. We call this, you know, it's pulling towards, so we'll just call that a wind pushing. And we have a wind pushing this way. Well, what's the, what's the net product of those two pushes? And they'll draw the net product line, which doesn't have anything to do with what the actual two things are doing. So again, the description is completely incomplete because it's giving you the the result and it's not telling you the cause so what everybody wants to know is what's the field cause what's the causal thing the mechanism and the simple answer is is there are two kinds of thing we know in the universe there's the plus thing and the minus thing and the plus thing and the minus thing can be understood as being the north thing or the south thing because <laughs> it's the same thing um, and what they do is two opposite things to the opposite charges so if this um, uh, so they're sitting here in space and now all you have to do is figure out well why do they do opposite things what could possibly cause an opposite reaction between the two things that it's always inverted so if I put a another white thing in here it's going to be repelled and then it's going to be attracted um, if I put a green thing in here it's going to be attracted and it's going to be repelled so it's exactly the opposite effect I drew that the wrong way it's going to be repelled <laughs> okay and it's going to be attracted um, details um, and so then they'll, you know, figure it's doing the circular thing. You know, it's not doing all that stuff. That's just an emergent effect. The real effect is, is that this thing is causing this thing to attract, and this thing is causing this thing to repel. And you have to come up with an explanation for why there would be such a difference in whatever they're producing. And we know this all moves at the speed of light, so this stuff is a something. It's not a nothing. If it was nothing, it wouldn't it wouldn't be bothered taking its time getting somewhere. <laughs> it's clearly a something. It's clearly something carrying momentum. And there's just no need to say, well, let's fill the whole universe with a bunch of little dots. And we'll say that momentum is, you know, this dot pushes on this dot and this dot pushes on that dot and a bunch of dominoes. Because as soon as you make the whole universe out of dominoes, then you have arrangement problems. You know where you have to stagger them and then you end up with these things called diagonals uh, that are longer distances than the you know straight lines and uh, you can't have straight line forces in such a universe practically there's just no way to have them in every vector there would be all kinds of inability to make a straight line um, and I mean a straight line not versus a curved line. I mean a straight line versus a line that ends up going like this. And the distance between this and this is going to be different. The amount of time it's going to take to get someplace will be different. We don't see any of that in the universe. So it's just an unnecessary to sit there and create some ether or some mechanism that which the force has to travel. It's just much easier to understand the force is like a frog and it can just jump wherever it's going and it just takes time to fly through the air and get there but it will just go there uh, you know and so there's this stuff in the universe called energy um force and the fact is is the energy the, the the energy is you know dense and full and lots of it it's it's the little arrows and they're real little arrows and they're all the same size arrows and they all have just a bit of momentum and the trick to understanding how you can have these two different properties between electrons and protons is just to understand that the arrows are two kinds uh, there's green arrows and there's white arrows in this case and hopefully you can see enough of that to get the picture
but it's just a little bit BB and they all have the same exact same length to the arrow same power and all that's really happening to these objects in this field of, of little BBs is that the green BBs reflect off the green objects and the white BBs reflect off of the white objects causing a little increase in momentum when they do that and the trick is is that the when the green hits a white it doesn't reflect in the same manner it reflects by losing uh, the reflection goes one way and the momentum goes this way perpendicular and so when the white does that to the green it also does the same thing it the force leaves perpendicular and it gets a little bit of momentum sideways and by creating that little distinction you create these different places in space where an object is going to be attracted okay here because the all the green stuff goes out perpendicular from this white one and all the green all the yeah all the all the green stuff goes perpendicular and green stuff hitting this little thing and all the white stuff hitting the green thing ends up going perpendicular it should be white uh, from this object and you end up with very little pressure here zero pressure because nothing can bounce back and forth and a very different thing happens between this white object and this white object because they constantly reflect any energy that's trapped between them any bit of momentum any ball bearing will just keep bouncing back and forth and the closer they get the more bounces will take place and the more energy and the more pressure away and all these lines are that they draw between these objects all those lines represent is what's the balance between how much reflection you have from this and how much vacuum you have going this way okay the zero part so so you know the low pressure versus the high pressure where will the object move in that pressure gradient so because at each location I have less repulsion this way and more attraction to this and if I get closer over here I have more repulsion here and less attraction here there's always a balance and the balance will create a line okay and that's what they draw and they say that's some sort of real thing well that's not the real thing that's the byproduct of the real thing the real thing is the repulsive pressure and the low pressure that, those are the real mechanisms deciding where something will move but the moving part is not the field the field is the little bits the field locations have a specific amount of of radiation of white radiation and green radio a specific amount of it is hitting the objects at each location and that specific amount of white and green is going to cause it to move a specific way in that specific um, place all right now they use a term isopro isoprophic lines or whatever and all this is is saying is where are uh, equal potential equal equi potential lines so that's just where you're saying if i make a round object right it's the same amount of repulsion okay if i put a same green color in here the same amount of repulsion will be at this location and this location the same distance away the same amount of repulsion because the force is coming from the outside and it's just reflecting and so the outside force is equal so the inside force is going to be the reflective force is going to be equal at the same distance so if i made the thing into a triangle the equal potential lines would also be a triangle um they're just telling you how far away you are and the further you away you are the weaker the force gets as pointed out the weaker the the vacuum you're creating gets because more energy can reflect in these directions you're exposed to all this extra energy as you move further away more and more angles can hit because you're not blocking them anymore and conversely with the same color object you could understand the further away i am the less these bb's it takes these bb's much longer to have interactions and those that longer time between interactions means less pressure hitting the object he gets hit by less bb's therefore there's less reason to go away 
All right, so um, so these lines don't really mean anything, and the silly thing they do is they'll put two two opposite objects next to each other, and then draw these lines in kind of almost silly ways. Um, so they'll put a, <coughs> a positive charge and a negative charge, and then they'll draw these silly lines, and then these lines start getting more and more eccentric and bent and crookedy and blah 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 and so they end up with a bunch of lines coming out of here and a bunch of lines coming out of here you know because all the lines converge and it looks like well this must be a lot of energy here no it's exactly the opposite this is where there's you know if these two things were equal distant this is where there's zero uh, potential to go this way or this way um, because what you really have to do is add up all these lines like if there's 20 of them and you, these are lines that go way far away from the object. So these are very weak lines that are the ones combining. These are weak, very, very weak lines. So you count the lines and you uh, divide by the number of lines, the intensity, and you'll get something, you know, right here in the middle. It's going to end up being zero, even though even if you averaged it, you wouldn't get that average because all the lines converge and smash on top of each other. So you can't average them anymore because they're on top of each other <laughs> well anyway but there's zero potential because you're just as attracted to one side as you are repelled by the other side I mean you're attracted equally to one object as you are the other object and um, so there's no potential to go anywhere when they're two same charges you're 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 being affected equally by both whether it's repulsion or attraction and so you don't do anything. Um, you don't move in any one direction because you have the same amount of impulse to go both ways. Uh, the same amount of pressure. But these lines don't mean anything. These lines are, you know, they're deceptive because they're, again, they're, they're measuring a quantity of how much of this pressure versus how much of that pressure and drawing it as a, you know, a distance line. And clearly you can't do that here because there's not enough space for you to draw the proper distance. So these lines shouldn't even go anywhere near here. Because that's only what an object has to do. An object has to make the... has to. If you gave it momentum and it's got a, an orbit, it's stuck with that uh, momentum. But this wouldn't really happen. What would really happen is the thing, the object would go around this way. It wouldn't bother doing this. So the lines are... A real deception when they start converging they're sort of a lie uh, but anyway they're not they're not evidence of a real thing again they're giving you the net 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 what is the net impact what is the effect they are not explaining the cause these lines are not the cause of the effect the cause of the effect is momentum hitting an object and either uh, and reflecting um, in two different ways, reflecting in a, with a likelihood of hitting you again, or reflecting with a likelihood of not hitting you again, and that's the real cause. Okay, should be enough context to proceed. We're playing some of this crap. Some of it. I'll just jump through it. Oh, great. It's not working. My mic went out. Um, let's have a look at what the expert, uh, Mr. Ken Wheeler, has to say. Well, let's start subject. over. Today we're going to talk about fields. In particular, we're going to try to answer the question, what is a field? Now, before we do that, I want to, um, let's have a look at what the expert, uh, Mr. Ken Wheeler, has to say on this subject. Sir, can you define this one word? No! They will never define it. Okay, descriptions are not explained. And everything in the universe is this. Fields. No branch of physics ever has a field, of course. I always mention the four Maxwellian field equations. And then I will point to them that Maxwellian field equations never define field. They only Okay, so again, the, this nonsense about defining something um, versus descriptions versus explanations versus all this crap. The point is, is you can model it. You can show somebody a field of corn, and then you can point out some facts about it that are maybe obscure but that's all 
when somebody's describing it, what you're attempting to do is give them as much detail as possible. Explain what a piece of corn is. Well, in this case, we're describing energy. We know there's energy transmitted in the sense that um, an effect is transmitted. And so what's causing the effect? Now, some people will give you all kinds of descriptions about what kind of magical mechanism. It's just this magical thing that happens. This thing says, come towards me. This thing says, go away from me. That's not much of a description, right? I mean, uh, you can't see the wind, right? In, in most cases, unless you put smoke in it or something. So you could have a wind tunnel and you could just show something smashing against the wall. Well, then you can put smoke in the wind and then you can show how these are little tunnels of wind and the, the, why the thing's moving. You can see the wind bounce off. You can get a much better view of why this effect happened. So we were just saying we know we agree on the effect and um, they're claiming Ken Wheeler and Fractal Person that they somehow have figured out um, the mechanism or they have a better description than conventional physics and they don't have a better description. They're just playing word games to pretend that because I can say equal potential line or something that I've somehow explained why that line exists and they haven't come close. We define a field as expressed in effect over a given vector over a period of time. Okay, so I basically agree with what Kent is saying here. He's saying um, that... Right, so she says no one has ever unambiguously defined a field. Right, and it's c conventional physics doesn't, but neither do you. So again, this whole video is sort of a... <clears throat> A fake promise like what is a feel like she's going to explain it unambiguously she doesn't do that she doesn't disambiguate any of the um, mechanisms she just sits there and defines them and says these are the equal potential lines <laughs> well gee so what <laughs> how did they get there what are they made out of uh, she didn't touch the subject jump ahead a little in physics a field means Okay, that's kind of a weird way of wording it, but uh, anyway, so that's basically what they're saying is it is um, it, it assigns a physical quantity to every point in space. A field is seen... Right, so you, you as what the space is, again, you it's an area. You're going to analyze an area of space. There's no way to, you know, do all of space because none of us know how far that even goes. But regardless, you're just saying in that area, the fact is that there is momentum in the field. There's places that are going to get to us, like pieces of a photon, that it will move from one place in the field to another place in the field because it's going somewhere. There's change. Will This change will migrate, and eventually the change will reach us and hit us, and it'll become an event where I see the photon. So the field is full of stuff like photon, stuff that carries momentum. It will push on my electrons. It will bang into them, kind of and it will cause the electrons to move and the electrons moving will cause electricity and electricity will go to my brain and my brain will make an image out of it. That's extending throughout a large region of space so that it influences everything. So in physics... So yes, the field appears to be in every location some, some piece of this thing's uh, existence, no matter how small it is, I mean, my finger is, in a sense, affecting the entire universe. You could go a trillion, zillion miles away and maybe have to wait a few days or years or hours, whatever, but you'll, there will be a change in your physical universe. Some little tiny plank piece of it will be different because my finger's in this position versus this position. You'll be able to see that from anywhere in the universe if you have a camera that can take a long enough exposure, technically. Um, basically, the field is the whole universe. You won't see it very well, because obviously it has to go through this building and through a lot of stuff, so you're not going to be able to see it as it was. You're going to probably have to use some computer software to try to find the finger again. But I'm just saying the difference in the universe between this and this, that difference travels a long way um, even though it travels there as a very weak signal yes um, so it extends throughout a large region of space maybe the whole universe so that it influences everything so their definition of, of the field is that the field influences things 
Okay, so that's just happening. Right, and what is influence? Influence is momentum, so obviously it's carrying this thing called momentum. It's carrying something that will cause electrons to move, and when electrons move, we see it. We can, we can turn the movement of an electron into some sort of information about what kind of field hit the electron, what kind of change in the field hit the electron. And then it's a change in momentum. Other defining it, the strength of the field usually varies over a region. So if the strength of the field didn't vary over a region, then you'd have flat space. So a flat. Right. And look, the, the basic argument is the same for me in physics in the sense that they're, they're conceding that every location has this vector in it. And the vector is an arrow. It's a piece of momentum moving in a direction. And if you have more vectors, more arrows pointed at you, then they're likely to have an effect. And you're going to likely move opposite, you know, or, or, or likely be having momentum imposed on you in a direction uh, that's um, consistent with the vectors that are pointing at you. Flat. Uh. The wind will blow you that way, right? The wind blowing this way will tend to blow you that way. Now, you can make little sailboats and different things where you can end up, you know, going against that wind. <laughs> okay, but you have to use a trick to do it. Um, land that didn't have any hills when it would be just a flat space. So, but generally, we're more interested in fields that vary over a certain region. And it was Michael Faraday uh, was the one to coin the term apparently in 1849. Okay, so um, so let's understand. But you know, Faraday was in a time where they would use two different kinds of vernacular, two different ways of describing reality. And so I just want to make this distinction one more time, really clear. Um, so they had these choices of words, and so um, even in Maxwell's equations, this is how charge is understood. It's understood as radiation, and you could draw it as nice little straight lines, and you could understand that the strength of the field is how close together are the lines. So where the lines are close, it's strong. Where the lines are further apart, it's getting weaker and weaker. So you can understand it clearly as rays, and you're just taking rays that are diverging over time, and that becomes the inverse square law, and um, that's how it's understood. And these would be called lines of force. Okay, so these are the um, how the field gets changed, and that it gets dominated by arrows going this way, and it gets dominated by arrows going this way by rays that have a consistent um, vector. Um, <clears throat> and the other term, so that's a line of force. And then what Faraday was talking about was um, field lines, and then, um, you know, these are lines of force, you know, field lines, okay. Uh, which, again, are the net product. What's the net product when I put two of these things in the same proximity, then I end up with an arrow going, you know, a, a ray going this way and a ray going that way. Well, what's the net effect of that? And they call that the vector. Well, the vector isn't the net effect. Okay, the fact that a location in space is going to have something go through it that's going to be going that way, and it's also going to have something going through it that's going that way, you don't say the space itself is going that way, you say, you, you understand that the, that location has essentially more than one piece of corn on it or whatever. It's, 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 if you want to get to the elemental, the fundamental, you understand that this is a composite now of two different forces, two different elements of momentum, um, and that that's what the thing is going to feel. It's going to feel more than one of those vectors at a time. More than one of those locations of space are going to converge on this location in space. And when they converge on this location in space, then you'll have the net effect. So the field lines are lines showing you the net product of the force lines, the real force vectors, the real field quantities that are causing the effect. So it's a composite, it's emergent field lines. Lines of force are elemental, field lines are emergent.
um, vectors, uh, things moving, is the elemental function. A wave is the emergent function. It's a group behavior. Uh, you know, it's really that simple. <sighs> Um, I want to generalize that a little bit. So I want to use the same definition, but I want to make it a little more general. So, so right, this is how you get more specific, is getting more general. So this, you're, the, you're, already, you're already saying this video is going to fail because she's already looking for a way to evade being specific about what this thing is made out of. So anyway, um, so different descriptions of a field, blah, blah, blah. Force. And the force itself is... Sh so she shows it as I'm stating, an area, okay? You have an area, and in the area is different pieces of stuff. And the thing to understand, though, is if you put a big thing in there, see, the little, the stuff is little tiny stuff, right? I mean, the, the real universe is made out of little tiny stuff, and you have a big thing, okay? You're going to understand that you're going to be interrupting stuff in all kinds of places. You've got all kinds of surface to hit with stuff. So you're going to have... You're going to be affected as a net. You're going to collect a whole bunch of vectors. And then you're going to have a net effect of collecting all of those vectors. But that's not your elemental condition. That's the resulting condition. The cause is all the little vectors. The effect is the addition of all those vectors into a net product here with the the red arrows are the bigger force and when the arrows are bigger it's a bigger force and the ones out here are smaller right well obviously it's not a bigger force it's just that you're more of it because you're closer to it so again it's just like light bulbs or anything else the force diminishes as you go further away because less of it's going to hit you it's just the way it is you become a smaller portion of the reality Okay, the reality creates a cone of your vision even. And the further away something gets, it gets smaller in that field of view, that, that cone. Uh, uh, arrows, meaning that the force is less out here. So each of these points in the box, and of course you can do all the points because there's an infinite number of locations inside this box. But right, well there really isn't an infinite number, so that's kind of just baby talk. Um, there's a whole big lot of them, yes and each one of them is a vector, but they can be almost in the same location. They maybe can be in the same location. The point is, is every point in space is being hit by more than one of them, theoretically. You uh, choose your spacing and you um, calculate your values for each point that you want to investigate within the box. And so, um, so a, a field is a region of the universe where each location within the field of view is assigned a physical quantity. Right. And the big thing to understand is the thing you're going to measure it with is big. So when you put the big thing in there, you're capturing a whole bunch of those little things. Okay. So a field is a mathematical... You're interacting with. Uh, let's not say capture. You're interacting with a whole bunch of them. So anything I test the field with is a big giant object that will be interacting with lots of portions of the field. Cool description. Okay, this is a mathematical description. These arrows and the length... So this is just more baby talk. This is a mathematical description. It can be turned into a mathematical uh, formulation uh, model, but the mathematical model isn't going to tell you that much uh, about what it is. Um, Clearly, I can't tell you what it is. I can say it. I'm representing it with an arrow pointing in a direction. Well, that's obviously can be turned into mathematics in the sense I can understand it has a vector going this way, a portion and a portion going this way, and I can do mathematical things to that. But that doesn't mean it is mathematical, and that doesn't mean math is the best way to model it. I can also just model it by drawing it and saying, look, that's the good model of it. It's a bit moving that way. Um... I don't need to turn into mathematics unless I need to do something to it, like say, well, what happens if I put this space 
if this bit hits the same piece of space, the piece of space here, and there's another bit heading right for that same piece of space going this way, well then what do I get? And yes, I can make a mathematical equation that takes this and this, and then combines it with, you know, this and that, you know, this, this vector, and allows me to do a nice little formulization where I can say equals, and I have a formula, and I get a nice little answer. Yeah, I can do that. But is that a good model? Is that showing you the cornfield? I mean, I can, I can mathematically describe what happens when wind blows across a cornfield, or I could just show you a picture of it, right? Which one is more enlightening in terms of getting it? Well, I'd say the image of the wind blowing is probably going to say a lot more than some mathematical equation about how much the, each corn stalk bent in the last millisecond. To the arrow uh, and the location of the arrow. These, this is all set that. So let's start with a positive charge. And let's so this is the typically insufficient, poorly done description where they show you what a charge is doing by having the um, you know, arrows going out, arrows going in, but no recognition that the elemental force is not a, a positive charge or a negative charge, that the two, the forces are actually opposites. And so this just gets you into trouble. And then in this description, all the arrows are the same length. I mean, obviously, because of the inverse square law, the arrows need to be big, okay, where there's a little tiny bit of space, and they need to be small where there's a whole bunch of space. So where you need to draw a big arrow, there's no space to draw it. When, where you need to draw a little arrow, there's too much space, and you won't see the arrow. So, you know, there's no good way to highlight this. I mean, she has them getting weaker, you know, in color, but you really don't get the distinction at all because it gets, they should be super, super bright in the center, you know, the ones close to the charge, and they rather dramatically get dark quickly. So obviously you don't get any of that feel. So this is not a very good description. It is not accurate. If I could, if I could show you the vectors, I sh could show you the force reflecting. It wouldn't look like that. Put in a negative charge. Okay, so you can. I will put a link. Right. So and again, so she's just showing you again the same pointing vectors that are net vectors. So all of these arrows are now pointing, not where the force is coming out. It, they're pointing where how much blue and how much red force is hitting this location. So it's telling you how much you know attraction I have one way and how much repulsion I have another way and how would I line up in that uh, if that was happening to me. How, how would those two combine and what would the combination be? So she could draw the straight lines and show you that there's this much blue hitting and this much red hitting and that's why the line bends. But that's all. That's the reason why there's any curves in any of these lines. There's no real curved force. The forces are straight lines going to those two locations and creating a net product. So this is just so deceptive. All right, now closer she, to the charges, the arrow gets bigger, which means it's feel so she's showing this as an arrow, right? So the, this how how long this red line gets. Obviously, that's how dramatic it is. The line is so long, close to the charge that you can't even see it on the page anymore. And as you go further away, the line gets so small you can't see which way it's pointing at all. So it's not a very good way to model. So as I move this around, you see as I move it further away, the arrow gets shorter, and I move, as I move it closer, the arrow gets really big. Right. So that's one way. So it obviously can't be very well modeled using that element of description. It just can't be described that way. Maybe you're better off using fatness of the line. Fat lines in the close and thin lines as you go further away might work better. So again, another poor model. Um, yeah, now she gets into the line stuff, so this is where it all goes wooey. Isopotential lines. Okay. All right, so this isopotential line is just telling you, you just establish how much purple is there. Okay, so this is just telling you if you're going to mix blue and red force, this line is just a description of where is there the same amount of proportions of purple to red. 
not the same amount of intensity, just the same amount of red to blue. So where is there an equal amount of red and blue? And that's that line. So it's not a, in any sense a real thing. It's just telling you that there's 2% and 2% or, uh, no, <laughs> that's 50-50 all the time. Yes, no matter what percentage it is. So whatever the intensity is, it's always 50-50. Uh, you know, it, it, this line's almost at that point. Um, that's all it's going to show you. It's not almost at that point. Obviously, it'd be almost a straight line if it was. But the point is, it's just showing you where there's the same percentage of blue and red hitting a location. So everywhere that I place this cursor, this X here, okay, I can place an ISO potential. And she's talking about it as if it's a voltage. Well, yeah, you can do that. Okay, north south is the same thing as plus minus. Um, and so you're just again saying, but clearly there's a difference between the minus sign in front of something and the plus sign. So, you know, you're combining two things in intensity. How intensely negative is something and how intensely positive is something. And if you don't make the lines a different color or do something, you're not going to really understand that it's a completely different thing. They're not the same intensity, they're exactly opposite intensities. Line. And as I move further away from the charges, the isopotential lines are bigger. And as I move closer to the charges, they're small. Right. And if you take away the other charge, you just have one charge, those lines become perfect circles around the original charge. So all you're doing is distorting by saying, now we're going to have a net product. Now we're going to add two colors. So the, if I did just red, then that'd be perfectly straight lines. If I did just blue, perfectly straight lines. And obviously, when I mix the two, there's going to be points where there's exactly the same amount of purple just as purpleness. We'll jump ahead. All right, this was pretty poor. So she's now comparing the um, lines created inside of a magnet, which are obviously all these lines don't show up. You never see any of this because it's such a weak line. The force is so weak, it doesn't do anything. So in spite of the fact she drew these arrows really big, these arrows don't exist here. There's so little difference in the force. There's just as much pull as there is push. Well, that's the wrong way to say it. Um, yes, that's where the, the force is strong, sorry. Um, but if I did two opposite um, charges, then none of these lines would, well, it doesn't really matter. Um, but anyway, this let's just get to this part. All right, so she has the magnetic filings, which are trapped on a piece of glass. So they don't have the freedom to move. They can't go where they really want to go. They have to stay in some kind of space that you're forcing them to exist in. So they're not going where they would go. The fluid inside the piece of glass is free to move. So the fluid inside the glass, the iron filings are doing what they would do if they were free to do that on this surface piece. They're, like if I put the magnet on top of those iron filings, all the iron will move right to the, the head of the magnet and they'll all spiral out, okay, in straight lines. So if I, if I, so this is again, this, these deceptions are sort of obvious because they're, you know, they're always, the experiment isn't allowing something to happen. And so it's, it's quote mining the, the reality. So if I allow the iron filings to, get to the magnet, okay, they'll line up like this. This is what they'll do, okay? There won't be any roundness or anything. This is where they'll go. They'll line up on the magnet, okay? And they'll have their north end, you know, their south end here and their north end here in terms of how they're lining up as little magnets. And all of them will have the same orientation, north, south, north, south. And they're going to repel each other, each one of these things. So they're going to just line up on lines. And that's what they are doing inside the piece of glass, is they're free to move towards the magnetic field. And so even though the magnet's not inside the glass, if the north end is up, they're just going to line up, you know, right on it. And if I put the magnet sideways, so you can see the north and the south end, it's just going to line up like this, okay? All the south ones will do this, and the north ones will do that, but they'll be, all be straight lines. There won't be any curved lines. There won't be any of this crap happening inside 
the glass. Now I've already done this with a, a, a microscope. Inside the ferro cell, inside the layer of liquid, okay, they're, they're just lining up radially. That's all they do. They line up radially. There's no, there's no magnetic curve lines inside the ferro cell at all. You can only create those by creating an artificial circumstance that doesn't allow the magnets to move into the magnet. That stops them from moving into the magnet. So that's the only time you'll ever see these stupid lines. So they're not the reality. They're distortion, perversion. Um, they're uh, inaccurate. So this doesn't mean anything. There's no, um, there's no correlation between there being two kinds of mechanisms beyond the fact that there's two kinds of poles and they're doing an opposite thing. Yes, you can make them look two different ways um, based on how much freedom you give the filings to move. Give them complete freedom, they will create in the ferro cell, and again, the, the, the misunderstanding is, is these lines of light have nothing to do with the actual arrangement of the ferrite. <laughs> the ferrite's doing the spiral thing, and all you're seeing in those lines is where the light reflects off the different spokes at a different location. Each spoke reflects the light at a different angle, and at one location you'll see a curved line, but the curved line has nothing to do with the actual alignment of each one of the spokes. It's just a distortion. Um, I mean, what do you call those mirrors that aren't flat mirrors? You know, it's, 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 it's a parlor trick, not science. If you look at this image very closely, you see there are a lot of similarities between where the iron, where the iron filings go and where these arrows go. And but what's even more in right so this is a these these are net force lines they don't mean anything they're not the actual force lines and so yes you've made two bad drawings match each other but they're just bad descriptions trusting because that is fairly well expected is that so just one more potential line but i could measure a whole bunch of them and this is what so she's proud that she measured this line by you know taking a meter and saying what's the net force as I go around the magnet what's the net force how much purple am I reading and that's all those lines represent is how much have you mixed the the repulsion and the attraction and that's all you're measuring it's how much of a mixture of repulsion and attraction is there it has nothing to do with the actual forces but you have to understand the actual forces are being caused by pressure and so you're really just saying how where what's the location that has uh, an absence of one force hitting me and an abundance of another force hitting me the ice potential lines look like around the magnet now this is again it's a mathematical construct it's not a mathematical construct it's uh, so certainly not in a drawing it's not um you can make it into mathematics you can mathematically describe it um, and and have math that describes you can make an image out of a mathematical formula but so what this, it's not about math it's about real forces that do real simple kinetic things all right so this was another very deceptive little pile of mush as I place the ball bearing on the piece of paper, it's not going in a straight line. It is actually following the isopotential curve. All right, it's so following the isopotential. So she's, besides being, um, you know, she's using a, a her table has a slant in it, so it's it the ball bearings getting velocity in a direction. So that's almost like calling it almost like the velocity of the Earth. And yes, it's 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 going to become magnetized in the magnetic field because it's steel. And so now it's going to attract to the magnet. And so that's all that's happening. It's just like gravity. So she's created a attractive force and given something a velocity in a direction. And so obviously if the table slanted and I start something in this direction and it's in proximity to a magnet, the magnet, okay, well she actually starts it in this direction, will obviously try it's getting pulled towards the magnet 
with a certain force and its velocity is a certain force. And as it slows down, it's actually getting closer to the magnet. So it's not following the isoprofil, the, the equal potential lines or whatever you want to call them. It's not following them. It's really in a degrade, it's in a degraded orbit. It's an orbit that will end up having it crash in. So it's not anything like being on the orbital line. So because it's crossing the lines. So she doesn't even have that part accurate. It's not really following any line. It is actually getting closer to the magnet. It's moving into the magnet. Now, as a baseline, as a baseline, I made a little video where I just dropped the uh, the um, ball bearing. Well, there I just placed it there. So, so it's obviously it moving. Way, it still goes it's along. It's attempting to move down and away. So obviously that would tend to create this orbit thing where it's initially going down and away. So the magnetic field is the stronger. It's pulling, pulling, turning it. And as it's getting closer and closer, it's more and more capable of pulling against that force. So this force is actually winning. It's pulling a lot more because it's pulling against, this is her, her motion, the velocity coming in. It's this downhill that she puts it on going away. And so that's why she's getting the curve. But that's it. It's not, it's not illustrating the real either it's not clearly illustrating the strength of the force because the force has to fight the velocity away from the magnet the isopotential line and so let's play that again just to show you what's going on okay, so, so that's the deception right it's really the line the energy pushing away is on a diagonal away from the magnet so that way right and so obviously if I start at uh, this location, it's going to curve. And like I said, the magnet wins in the end. So she's, the velocity isn't greater than the pull in. And so it's just making the arc it would make just like the earth would make the same arc. It's, there's no ISO, there's no, it's not following any geometry that is symmetrical. So, but that's not what makes this important. So equal potential lines are always perpendicular to the electric field. Okay, we know that. Um, in <laughs> yes, so the force is actually always away from the object and it's always the mixture is going to change. So you have one place where, oh yes, the force is all equal. Well, yes, of course, the next step has to be something, you know, it's, it's going to be something different than that, you know, in some direction. So it always has to leave neutral I mean, it always has to leave from an equal position. It's got equal amount. Where it's sitting, left and right is equal. Where it's going, left and right isn't equal. So obviously it will leave equal and it will bend as the field requires. So let's just get to this conclusion, which is mush. Of the forces, of the potential, of the strength, of the magnetic field, the further we... Right. So again, those lines are just a, they should draw it as purple. And you could just draw it as different from violet to, you know, from, from red purple to blue purple. And that would be a much better illustration of showing you how much one side is affecting it versus the other impulse. The two impulses are being combined. One of them's going to have a positive effect in terms of pulling it towards. The other one's going to be a negative in terms of pushing it away get from the magnet, the, the lower the strength of the magnetic field, of the magnetic force. So again, it's not, it has nothing to do with the strength of the forces, the number of arrows. It just has to do with whether you have more red arrows or blue arrows. Okay. So then when you're looking closer, you see that, so these lines would be analogous to these arrows from the electric Again, which are not elemental. The arrows are not an elemental function. The elemental function is the straight lines. And this, you could draw the straight lines from the two points to each one of those arrows, and you would understand that the red line was longer than the blue line, and that's why the arrow is in a different direction. They're always nets. They're always byproducts. It's not the elemental function. It's the emergent function. Field, um, 
diagram. Okay, so what is a field? Well, what is what is a field not? Okay, a field is not a thing in of itself. Yeah, it's a. There's no point in saying it's not a thing in and of itself because the whole point of the the description is that it's a field of somethings, somethings. It's it can't be a field of one thing. It has to be a field of things. Okay, so that's the easy part. But to say it's not a thing again is just this. That I don't. This isn't constructive. Of course, it's a thing. It's full of things. I mean, a bag of jelly beans is a field of jelly beans in a bag. It's a point, okay? A field point, sorry, is a mathematical abstraction of a force. Well, again, it's not a mathematical element. There's, math isn't what reality is made out of. Reality is made out of stuff, little things. It's a bit of momentum in a location, period. And the momentum has a speed. That's plainly obvious so every point every location within this field is um, assigned a force and a direction a vector right and you are assigning you're telling me what the net product is you're telling me what purple it is you're not telling me how much blue and how much red it is you're not getting to the element okay a field cannot be felt that's just silly <laughs> Clearly, you can be affected by the field. You go into the field, you'll be affected by it. Yes, if you're standing outside of the box of stuff, you're not going to feel what's in the box. But if I go in there, I'm going to sure as hell feel it. Only forces can be felt. So, more mush. Uh, force is the movement of the field. There's stuff in the field. If it didn't do anything, if the stuff all just stays there and just minds its own business, it isn't moving at all, the field can't do anything. Yes, the bits inside the field need to have action. If they don't have action, there's nothing. It's uh, moot. There's nothing to add up. There's nothing to be, um, nothing to affect anything by the field. The field is inert and um, meaningless. The only forces can be felt. So, so again, it's you call what the field is doing a force. When the corn is waving, you call that, you know, the force. But the force isn't the corn. Forces are real, and fields are abstract. Okay, the field is is a math. So uh, whatever says you. Um, I don't see it connected to any any coherent description of why something attracts and repels. So again, you still haven't explained where action comes from, where the movement of the magnet or the movement of the ball bearing or any of that stuff comes from, what caused it, where how did the momentum get from being a location in space to being consequential to the objects that move. You didn't deal with any of it abstraction of a force so forces are the only things that are real yeah so there's just no point I mean we know that the forces can be in the field and the force is just describing which way the stuff in the field is moving and the very fact that they're described mathematically as vectors pointing in a direction clearly means that regular physics at least understands the field is full of momentum that's what all those little vectors are, is momentum. The field is full of momentum, full of action, full of force. Okay. So now the, you know, the job of physics is to, um, to try to figure out, you know, why do the forces behave? Why do we have forces that behave like magnetism? Yes, well, the reason why you have things that are dipoles, that behave like dipoles, behave differently than monopoles. But that's all you really have, is you have two kinds of material object that are affected by the field of vector energy. And the two kinds of objects are plus and minus electron proton, or north and south as a magnet, and that's it. And the two forces have two types of interaction. One interaction that causes a reflection, the other interaction causes a bisection uh, on the perpendicular. And with those two kinds of interactions and those two kinds of forces and those two kinds of matter bits, you can explain every phenomenon that takes place in the material universe. 
So somebody has done it. I have answered the question more completely and more reasonably and without any woo or magic or uh, unanswered uh, questions. A lot fewer unanswered questions. All right, so till the next time and such. And so forth and whatnot. I think that's all she says. Right, what is it that creates these forces that we can mathematically describe with fields um, and that's basically uh, what right and you didn't answer the question so you said what is a field and then your answer is it's a fieldy thing <laughs> what physics is trying to do so so hopefully in this um, video I've cleared up the idea of a field or at least I've defined a field this is how I define no you didn't do any of this well you're, again so you committed um, Ken Wheeler's critical error. You keep giving me descriptions, definitions, without any explanation. Um, but I'm not going to play a word game. I'm just going to say your details are wrong. They're your examples are illusions. Your pharaoh cell is a trick. Okay, It's uh, an emergent thing again. It's not showing you the elemental function. It's showing you a much more complex interaction. And likewise, your 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 net lines, what's the net force lines, are not getting to the elements that caused the net reactions. Field. I define a field as a region of the universe where each location in the field of view is assigned a physical quantity. And again, you, assigning it a net quantity is rather ludicrous until you actually have something in that location, right? So you're saying this is what the field is there. Well, it isn't until you put something in there to get hit by the object. So again, depending on what object I put in, if I put a small object in, it's only going to interact with a certain number of arrows. Uh, at any one more time, put a bigger object in, it's obviously going to intersect a lot more arrows, and it's going to be affected differently than the small object. So no matter the size of the object is going to decide what the field is, is at this location, right? I'm basically going to say what's the field at this location by putting something on that location that's huge. So I'm obviously not doing this location anymore. I'm doing this location and this location and this location and this location and this location. Uh, all of those are going to be what this will show me. This will never, <coughs> ever, 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 ever show me what the field is in one tiny piece of space because this thing I'm testing with will never be as small as this thing. Just as I will never see a photon by bouncing photons off of it. So you're, you're wrongly premised to think you can um, dissect the field uh, with, you know, uh, what would you call those? Samurai swords. Bad dissection device. So a field is not a thing. A field does not do anything. A field does not act on anything. Um, so more just rubbish talk. I mean, clearly the field, the stuff it's full of, is going to act on something. Clearly the photons go through space and they eventually get to me and they act on me. Clearly. But they're, they're real. They're real. In a they're real, but they're not. You, you, <laughs> Jesus, mush. You can say they're real, but they're not. Because all you're showing me is abstractions. You're not showing me what they really are. You're showing me what they do again. I already know what they do. Sense that. They're real in the sense that, uh, especially the isopotential lines, the isopotential lines, which many think are... So again, they're, yes, many think are meaningless in the sense that, yes, obviously when you're the same amount of, you have 3%... Uh, red and 3% blue, it's going to be the same as when you're 2% red and 2% blue. Are, ...are not real, that don't, don't correspond to physical reality, uh, at least I've argued with people about this, not everyone thinks this, but some people still don't get it, that the isopotential line... Well, you don't get that this is not really following the exact line, so if you actually measure the exact line on this piece of paper and then do your little ball bearing, you'll see that it's not actually following the line. So you could measure the line, you could get your iso uh, line right here, and you'll see that your little ball bearing does tend to cross a couple of those lines. It's not traveling on the line. It's crossing the lines because it's going to be in a degrading orbit. 
you're either going to roll the ball so it flies out of the gravity or that it goes in. It's really hard to roll the ball on the line. Theoretically, really difficult. Lines are um, just as real as the electrical potential lines. And you can see it right there. So again, it's this has nothing to do with those lines. It has to do with um, the fact that as you get closer to a magnet, it gets stronger and you're doomed. Just as gravity will do this, like I said, it's, I don't need to, no point in going into it. Um, stable orbits are um, a tiny orbit. <laughs> okay, the unstable ones are a lot easier to find. So, um, what, whatever. I think she's done now. You can see it right there. So, um, yeah, blah, 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 blah. So more Ken Wheeler style horrible experiments that um, are so outside the boundaries of being well controlled to demonstrate something. So again, um, just completely false notions, however you want to say it. She's not accounting for the fact that there's two forces acting on the ball bearing, the force of the pitch of the table and the gravity and uh, the magnet. And uh, you're not going to find proportionality between those two forces. So anyway, uh, enough of a video. So till the next time and such.